Well, hello and welcome to today's 18 group webinar on tackling digital transformation challenges for operational teams. My name is Mike O'Hara. Uh, I'm a regular contributor to the A-Team's uh, publications and I'll be moderating today's webinar. And I'm delighted to be joined today by a panel of expert speakers. Uh, we have uh, Omar Abdul Jalil, who is Associate Direct Director of Digital Transformation at RBC Capital Markets. Uh, Rushir Verma, who is Head of Global Services at, uh, for Investment Management Transformation and Shared Services at Zurich Insurance and Neil Vernon, Chief Technology Officer of Gresham Technologies. So welcome to you all, and uh, I look forward to you introducing yourselves in a moment. But first, just some information uh, on how everybody can take part in today's webinar. To the right of the video, you'll see a box for questions and polls. Uh, we'll actually be running three polls during the webinar today, so please do vote and help us to gauge industry opinion. Um, and I'll remind uh, the audience of when the polls are coming up. If at any stage you would like to ask uh, the panel any questions, we will be taking questions from the audience throughout the webinar. So please do feel free to add your question to the box underneath the questions tab. So enough of me and over to our speakers. Uh, Omar, uh, can I start with you to please introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about your interest in digital transformation and its impact on operations. Yeah, absolutely. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending. Uh, I've always had an interest in emerging tech and trying to solve problems through technology. Uh, I've had and held a number of various digital transformation innovation roles across uh, a couple of organizations within capital markets and wealth management. Right now, I work at RBC, but I've worked at Fidelity, um, Kenzie Investments, which is a Canadian-based asset management company, and then CIBC Capital Markets. Great, thank you, Omar. Rishir? Hi, everyone. So, Rishir, I work for Zurich um, Insurance Company in the investment management part of the business, and I look after the global services. So, it's, it's a wide remit, but in a nutshell, it's about shaping and safeguarding. So, shaping is what we call all our transformation, innovation, new tech ideas that we can bring into the back office part of the organization. Um, we have done many, many things over the last many years in, in transformation, in operations, reg tech, data strategy, data as a service, uh, building up of infrastructure, part of data hub, and so on. So happy to share my insights here. Great. Thank you, Rashir. And uh, Neil? Yeah, Neil Vernon, uh, Group CTO for Gresham Tech. I set product strategy and run development, some 70-odd developers working for Gresham these days and my particular interest is really rooted in, in the three products that we take to market it's around data around connectivity and around control and all of those products and capabilities are used in some form in, in digital transformation projects so our, our our life and blood is is really centered around digital transformation Brilliant. Well, it's great to have you all here. I'm looking forward to uh, an interesting conversation. Um, so before we get into that conversation, uh, we're going to have an audience poll, the first uh, poll of the three. And the question uh, for this poll is, how wide is the gap between the front office and back office at your organisation? Uh, five options there. Extremely wide, very wide, fairly wide, not very wide, or there is no gap. So um, if... Uh, the viewers can uh, can please go ahead and vote there. And uh, while that question is being answered, um, I'll put the same question to you, actually, Omar. I mean, how wide do you think the gap is between the front office and the back office? And, and why is this the case? Yeah, so, well, look, the front office are essentially the sole revenue generators of an organization. Plus, they have significant and frequent client interactions. So getting this right is usually an organization's first priority. And with that in mind, it might always feel like the front office has limitless budgets to experiment and perfect their sales cycle. Uh, well, back office teams need to be a bit more creative with their limited resources and they need to find money ball strategies to solve for any of their inefficiencies. Uh, I'm sure we'll see from the poll, uh, the gap defers or at least the perception of it varies between organizations, but that gap is getting larger. So fortunately, organizations have relied on data strategies and service blueprinting techniques uh, to truly understand the end-to-end -end or 360-degree view of the client experience, um, while better integrating front and back office teams for a smoother transaction lifecycle. Mm -hmm. Neil, what are your thoughts on that? Do you um, would you agree with Omar there? 
Well, I, I, I do, and I thought I might give you a little an anecdote, because I quite, I quite like anecdotes, and uh, this is about a, a, a UK insurer, um, actually not Zurich, just to be clear. <laughs> um, I, I have my pension there, actually, and I use one of those money aggregation apps that tell you uh, about the state of all the transactions that's going through your system. And one day I was looking at my app, and I found out that this um, pension fund, this insurer, had compensated me. Something had gone wrong, and it, it struck me that, that was somewhat strange. So I, 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 I called up the, 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 the insurer and said, what, "What's gone wrong?" And they, and they said to me, "Well, actually, you, you're, you're seeing the output from our T system. We're in the back office. We only get the data on T plus one. You need to call us back tomorrow." And I think that is, in in a, in a way, that's the gap, isn't it, between the front yeah. office and the back office? It's, it's the T versus T plus one. It's the here and now in the front office, mm. and the wait till tomorrow, or much longer in the back office. And, and yeah. it's, it's it's gap of time, it's gap of spend, it's gap of capability. Yeah. It's gap. There's a, there's a gaps everywhere. Yeah, indeed, indeed. So um, thanks for that. We're we're just seeing the results of the poll come in, and uh, you are correct. It's the uh, the 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 gap, uh, we got 50% of people saying the gap is very wide and 40% saying it's fairly wide. Um, not surprisingly, there's uh, no one saying there is no gap or that it's not very wide. So that's, uh, um, I mean, does that tie in with, uh, with your expectations? Rashir, what, 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 what are your views on that, uh, that poll result? Yeah, yeah, I think it's, it's as much about perception as it is about reality, right? So. And I think from that point of view, um, yeah, it's it's very much in line. I, I would have been surprised to see the last one being picked. There is no gap uh, mm -hmm. because traditionally these these are two different ends. And as much as technology and processes and so on are trying to get them closer together, we're, we're not there yet at all. Yeah, yeah. So um, staying with you for the moment, uh, Rashir, looking specifically at operations, uh, what do you think is the, is the impact of digital transformation uh, on operations? Yeah, yeah. I mean, digital operation, digital transformation, specifically for operations. If you look at, um, it's always been about efficiency, right? Trying to do more with less, trying to uh, have operational benefits like reduction in errors, like uh, more controls, more governance, you know, faster, better, and so on. I think we. With technology and with maturity, people are now looking forward to other dimensions as well of value, right? So it's not just about doing things better, faster, quicker. It's about, can you add to the width of data along with the depth of data, which then provides the analytical insights, which might then be very helpful to the front office, for example, right? So it's connecting the dots to the circle. I think um, digital transformation also has resulted in access to the data, which was either not possible or not easily possible before, right? So you had limited access, you had different formats, different things that were not joined together. Now, suddenly there is an ability to look at things in many, many different ways, right? Mm -hmm. And many of these things are fostered by the back office transformation or operations transformation, not necessarily the front end transformation. Mm -hmm. Um, Omar, uh, would you like to pick up on anything that, uh, that Rishi has said there? Yeah, I, I definitely agree with everything Rishi is saying. But in addition to that, I would say, well, most people look at digital transformation or modernization being a program that takes you from point A to point B, which is still true. It's also building a back office organization that can be better equipped to adapt as fast as the markets are changing. So, you know, how how do we as financial institutions uh, start to trade digital assets in the future? That's one example. Mm -hmm. And if done right, the end result is essentially an operations division that would be able to meet client needs. It becomes more engaging to employees that are mainly focused on exception handling. Um, and it provides, uh, like Rashir mentioned, the right metrics and reporting to leaders so that they can make data-driven decisions rather than rely on intuition and seniority. And so mm -hmm. the, war, the war for market share, um, I would say, is relying on how an organization can best offer digital experiences, while internally, there's always a push to drive those cost efficiencies, although the payoff will continue to remain elusive when there's very little knowledge or even commitment when it comes to quantifying a qualitative benefit. Mm -hmm. And, and Risha, just coming back to you there, I mean, how, how do you think that back office teams can 
best prepare for digital transformation to ensure that they're meeting the kind of front office requirements? I, I think the gap is probably the first one, the obvious one from the poor, right? So that gap needs to narrow in, in many different ways, right? Which brings us not just to technology, of course, technology plays a big part in there, but there is also about perspective, right? End-to-end -end perspective and skills. So when we talk about skills and what's changing as a result of digital transformation, I think the, um, one of the key things we found is, is the confluence of skills is the most valuable thing. So you don't need your traditional operations or back office stuff that you used a few years ago. What you need in addition to that is the confluence of skills between technology, data, business, context, something who is able to then expand on the, on the mandate of the back office because you have those insights to add value to the business in front, right? Mm -hmm. So it, I would say that skills is definitely one of the key criteria here. Technology-wise, I have to say um, it's it's getting better and better. It's getting more flexible. It's getting, um, I'd say, we don't have to do a big bang implementation to make a change. You can actually do it incrementally, depending on the palette of technologies that you choose there. Mm -hmm. um, any thoughts from you on that, Neil? Yeah, I, and I might just want to challenge something that Rishi said earlier on, actually, which was uh, around about doing more with less. And of course, that's true. We, we're all being asked to do more with less. But the challenge, actually, I'd say is, why are we doing some of the things that we do at all, actually? So, some things that we used to do that were unique to us, that were differentiating for us, that were actually accruative to the bottom line, were, it was important that we did them. But over time, those things become less and less unique to us, more and more commoditized, more and more available as a service. And we shouldn't be doing them at all. We should buy that service. Mm -hmm. So as I say, it's not about doing more, well, doing more with less. Actually, it's about, it's about doing less, doing less of the things that are commodity and, and moving those to a commodity provision. That will actually save you cost. Yeah. But beyond, beyond you know, that, I think, I think you've really got to be able to measure what you're doing across the, the, your entire back office because, you know, that adage about you, 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 can't, you can't manage what you don't measure, you've really got to be looking across your organisation, your back office organisation, really understanding that organisation and understanding where your data is produced, where it's consumed, where that data goes wrong, where you've got the biggest problems, where you should be spending money on fixing those problems and why you should be spending that money. So that analysis and that understanding... Uh, is really important. You, you need you need to get yourself in control of the back office before, as part of that transformational, as, as part of that digital transformation. If you're not in control of it, then I, I, I don't think you can have confidence that your transformation efforts will be will will be best um, will, will deliver the best results. Yeah. Would you like to respond to that at all, Rishi? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so doing more with less is is a very uh, generic statement, and you want to get. Um, specific enough, right, to do in-house or outsource and where should you optimize for efficiency, where you should optimize for value. So maybe I can give you one insight from, from our digital strategy where we use two dimensions of differentiating, non-differentiating, and then critical, non-critical. If you think about the four boxes, you can have a very simple strategy for each of the boxes, right? So non-differentiating, non-critical, optimize for efficiency, outsource, do what you want to, right? Buy it at scale from a, a vendor at a cheaper price. You have critical and non-differentiating. You can have things like managed services. So for, for example, we have gone through the strategy of data as a service in certain areas where we thought it's critical, but it's non-differentiating for us. And we cannot build a scale being one single institution. While a vendor who's serving 10, 20, 30 institutions with the same data, they can provide us more value. So we went with data as a service in that box. And then comes the whole differentiating box, whether it's critical, non-critical, our dominant strategy is to keep in-house and build insights on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I just, interesting thoughts there actually. And I think it's, uh, it, it's, uh, that's a good way of, of kind of defining it, whether it's differentiating or non-differentiating and critical or non-critical and, and kind of ties in with, uh, I think a lot of other areas in terms of what you could be doing, you should be, could or should be doing yourself versus what you can outsource. So Neil, I mean, coming back to you 
for a moment. Um, how can heads of operations build a, a business case for change and secure the kind of stakeholder support they need for, for back office modernization? Well, I think Rishi's stolen my thunder a little bit because <laughs> it, it is exactly about understanding what you should continue to carry on doing versus what you should outsource and what you should track, what, what should be a managed service for you. So there, there is that, and there's absolutely that analysis phase of understanding what's going on. But then, secondly, it, it is actually really about understanding your organization better. And what, what I find in a, in a large number of these projects that we do is that um, people rush to implement, which is a good thing, actually, in, in many ways. It, it tees out the problems. But a little bit of analysis goes a long, long way. Figuring out what processes are no longer required. You know, the, 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 the export to System X, the, the downstream published to System Y, and you figure out that actually nobody, nobody needs that data anymore. The, the things that you used to do are no longer required. There's a lot of stuff that, well, I think many of the back offices that we see are these huge kind of spiders webs of data flowing from A to B to C to D. And a lot of it happens for no good reason anymore. So, so I think I think there's part of the part of the answer around building the business case is to say there is a whole set of things that we're doing that we can stop doing, and that that in itself can save money. And then and then if if you if you if you move the non-differentiating things as Rashia calls it, the the stuff that's commodity provision, the stuff that's non-differentiating, if you if you move that to to a commodity provider. I, th I think it's relatively easy to show business case. A word of caution, though, because as you move more and more things out of your organization, you're going to feel as though you're out of control. Things that you used to be able to just walk around the office and say, how's this going? Mm. You can no longer do that. Mm. So you need, to, you need to have capabilities and you need to factor into your business case. The, 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 the monitoring, the, the SLAs, the, the capabilities of, of control so that you can be certain that your outsource provision is really working in the way that you expect it to work in the way that you can currently do for a walk around the office. Mm -hmm. you, need, you need dashboards and, and, and visibility to your outsource providers. Yeah. And Omar, do you have any, any thoughts on this, this particular area? Um, I think the main selling point for our team at, at RBC Capital Markets has been to make our stakeholders aware of the urgency to modernize our systems, processes, and technology. The next five years are going to be more disruptive than the last 15. And as we continue to see the rise of unicorn fintechs, uh, tech fins, where technology conglomerates essentially expanding into financial services, and then regulatory bodies pushing organizations to be faster, quicker, and more transparent. Uh, the big selling points, at least for us, aren't just to go digital or to cut costs, but it's also to drive alignment between the front and the back office uh, or back offices, as well as to provide all of our clients, not just the high net worth ones, an effortless experience. Um, identifying and calculating the ROI is critical too, um, and we need KPIs to illustrate how a modernization program can essentially improve the back office in, in four things. Customer engagement, operational efficiency, employee satisfaction, and then how do we create new sources of value creation? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, I think we've got another poll coming up, actually, and it is uh, the question here is what are the challenges of building a digital foundation based on back office processes, systems and technology at your organization? And uh, this is a multiple answer poll, so um, please choose any and all that apply uh, across legacy systems, systems integration, manual workarounds, winning management buy-in, lack of skills or time, or there are no challenges. Um, so I'd be surprised if uh, if we get that one, but I won't preempt it. Um, so again, while people are answering uh, that uh, that poll, uh, we'll come on to um, uh, come back to you actually, Omar. If you can maybe talk for a couple of minutes about the the challenges of building a digital foundation based on back office processes uh, that can support uh, transformation programs. Yeah, and, and uh, obviously there's all there's always going to be a gap in the legacy infrastructure that any organization carries. But what I would say is I'd summarize the biggest challenges with establishing that digital foundation with two words, unfocused and misalignment. 
So establishing a major transformation program without the appropriate strategy is a recipe for disaster. And assuming we pass the vision definition and analysis stages of a program, a major challenge is to ensure all of our stakeholders, particularly senior executives, remain focused on the roadmap while being nimble enough to pivot if needed. Every new technology, vendor, idea, et cetera, can be a major distraction and, and taking us away from that roadmap. Second, I'd say it's imperative to ensure that an organization is aligned with both its clients and its employees. So clients are constantly on the lookout for an effortless experience through self-service models, or at least they want a consistent service for all of their transactions. Mm -hmm. Internally, cross-functional teams need to be aligned on the end goal and its anticipated benefits without overhyping. So for example, moving from a paper-based or fax-based forms to a spreadsheet, it's not revolutionary, but it still points to a radical change that a, an organization still needs to go through. Great, thank you. So um, it looks like we're getting some, uh, some good responses to the, to the poll. And the biggest uh, challenge, according to the audience of the webinar, is uh, systems integration, closely followed by legacy systems and manual workarounds with lack of skills and time and winning management by in um, less of a challenge, uh, I guess. So, um, Rashir, uh, would you like to, to maybe comment on those results and, uh, yeah. and then talk about maybe how the challenges can be resolved? Uh, it's interesting because I, I was thinking about this and I would have thought that the first three challenges, mainly around technology and processes, they are becoming easier and easier, going back to my previous comment, right, with the new technologies that are coming in, the, the ease of being able to extract data and build a data model or an architecture outside of your legacy systems, right? Being able to integrate in an enterprise environment, irrespective of the source of that data or application and the flexibility that brings. I think those, those challenges uh, from technology and processes will reduce over a period of time if they haven't already, right? So mm -hmm. we, we have we have solved some of those challenges by, by a data strategy that gives us a flexible end, right? So we collect the data in a data hub and then we use it from there on, right? So it's a two, three step kind of a strategy. For, for us though, I would say the biggest challenge I see is actually in the bottom two, or sorry, the, the one before bottom two, lack of skills. And here I would go back to, it's not just the technological skills. I think we can get technological skills. It's more about those confluence of skills, right? Where in traditional back office, people have been away from the whole big picture, right? Very focused on what they're doing in their silo. I, I think the skills that go across those boundaries and connect to business and connect to context and connect to uh, the latest happenings and so on, I think that's that's very valuable not across the board but you need some of those key people in the team mm -hmm. that have that perspective and the same for the last one right winning management buy-in um, as omar was saying before it's it's different right so front office revenue generating business cases tend to be very different from a back office business case which is cost reduction right so there i think the stint is how can we add value how can it circle back to the front and somehow become revenue enabling. And that's where you get the buy. Got you. Um, and uh, Neil, uh, any thoughts from you on these, these poll results? Yeah, and, and I don't want to challenge Rashir again, but I am going to challenge <laughs> Rashir again, actually. Go for and, it. Uh, and, and, and I don't know what I must said, actually, just to really stir things up. Um, Rashir talked about um, new systems being really simple to integrate. I'm, I'm misquoting, and I apologise, but... Uh, the, the the ease of integration and, uh, and Omar talked about self service, and we see that time and time again. Actually, that um, you know these new systems that have come about look to be really easy to integrate, look to be really easy for self service. So you just drag a bit a bit of data from here and you drag it to there, and suddenly you've got some systems integration. It doesn't work. It simply doesn't work. What what happens actually is um, every day is a bad day. Every day, something will go wrong. And that really simple bit of wiring won't deal with the exception. You'll deal with the good stuff. You know, the flow, all the good flows will work perfectly. The bad flows will just disappear. When, when you're looking at connecting systems together, you, you, <laughs> it's trite and kind of obvious, but you, you need enterprise-grade capabilities. 
Mm. And you need, and I'm sorry, but you 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 do unfortunately need a technical mindset. You you, you need a you need that pessimism as a technologist to, to tell you that this can go wrong, and when this goes wrong, this is what I need to do. Mm. And you need you need integration capabilities, connectivity capabilities. They're going to deal with a bad day because, quite frankly, you know the, the the good day is really really easy. And that's what that's that's where people get sucked in. They 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 they, they see the dragon they drop and they think, gosh, I can do. I'm 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 now an integration specialist as as well as an equities trader, and and it and it doesn't it just it just doesn't work. So focus on using the right tools for the right job. Yeah. Don't be sucked in by look by how easy it looks. Do be a pessimist. Think about every day being a bad day. If something will, can go wrong, it will go wrong across the, the hundreds or millions of transactions that you do every day. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that would be my advice. Be pessimistic, be yeah. safe and smile. <laughs> and I, I, I'd like to, um, to to get Rashir and Omar's response on that as well, actually. So you, yep. so you agree that you, you have to be pessimistic about these things? I like it, Neil. The challenges are interesting. So <laughs> we go back. Right, so when I say it's possible and it's easier than before, I by no means meant it's a drag and drop, right? It's the enterprise grade integration. But those same integration that used to take months and years in the old technology to enable with the typical ETL kind of processes, they are much simpler, much, yeah. much better. You can test them very quickly. You can get to a quality check very quickly. So, so the confidence is better, first of all, because you can see the results very quickly. And second of all, I, I think it does make it much faster and much, um, much um, I don't want to say uh, easier from a, from a technology perspective, but easier from a consumer perspective to see the results and say, okay, yeah, that's there, right? Mm-hmm. Bad days will happen, uh, I guess, irrespective of what you do, that's for sure, because that's where we get into exception management kind of mindset and say, okay, how can we reduce the volume of those bad days or volume of those uh, exception management that come to us? But my wider point was it's, it's definitely easier. So if you have a old, an old IBM mainframe or if you have a legacy system that was built on COBOL or something, there are ways of extracting that data, establishing the link and making sure you can actually put use to that data in ways that was simply not possible many years ago. Yeah, yeah. And Omar, um, any thoughts from you before we go to, we've got some audience questions coming through, which uh, uh, I'd quite like to uh, to get onto, but I mean, with anything you'd add to? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with what both said. The only thing I would challenge Neil on is, I, I don't think digital transformation practitioners should, we need to have critical thought. We need to challenge when someone comes in and says, I think, and AI can solve for this process where we have multiple handoffs. We need to be optimistic and visionary, but we still need to have that critical thought. Um, what I would say is I'm, I'm actually quite pleased to see system integration being the top uh, rated uh, choice on the poll, because not only is it the flow of data as Rashir was, was uh, mentioning, but it's also when you have new employees join your team, you don't want to train them on several different systems. Sometimes it's just adding a layer or wrapper that consolidates all of the information you see from these legacy systems into one. And you just need to train your employees on one platform rather than multiple codes and and platforms and systems that just take weeks, if not months to, to get people fully onboarded on. Gotcha. Thank you. So, um, We've had some uh, questions coming in from the uh, the audience. So I'd like to, uh, if I can go to the first one here, um, an interesting one actually, uh, I'd be interested to get the panel's thoughts on this. How do you overcome the root causes of problem data, the data created at source incorrectly? And I don't know which of you would like to pick up on that one first. Neil. I'll, I'll have a crack. <laughs> and I think the first part is actually uh, the, uh, the most important part is actually knowing that that's gone wrong and, and being able to control your data, being able to measure your data, being able to establish which data items are, you can have absolute confidence in which data items are wrong and figure out wh- where they gone wrong. This is not always an initiation, actually. It can be at various points in the flow. And I think actually 
many organizations will have this hunch, you know, we know that our LEIs aren't very good, but they, they, they won't know how many aren't good and they won't know over which dimensions it is, you know, is it, is it the, the, which product line is giving rise to the, them going wrong. So I think it's back to what I said earlier, really uh, around measuring before you manage, let's, let's, let's take control of our data. Let's measure it. Let's understand our data. And, and then we can figure out the appropriate responses to, to where, where things go wrong and how we get them repaired as quickly as possible. Great, thank you. Uh, Omar and, and Rashir, either of you were? Uh, uh... Yeah, I can, I, I can jump in. So I think um, it, it, it's tricky. I don't know if you can solve for it right away, but maybe looking at just the overall client onboarding or whatever the first step of the client journey looks like. And that's when we start to collect that initial data. I, I think it's important to, to develop processes and target operating models where we can consume as much of that data as possible while still ensuring that that relationship with the client is still smooth. Because you don't want to ask them a ton of questions. You want the bare minimum, but at the same time, you don't want issues with your back office process as well. In the meantime, I think also solving for some of the static or reference data that we uh, we need to embed as part of the overall onboarding data, that's gonna be critical as well. Um, yeah, the, the, that, that's my two cents in terms of how to address both of those. Thank you. And uh, Rishi, anything to add? Oh, very, very quickly. So I, first of all, I agree with Neil on, on diagnostics, right? Finding the problem and where it is, that's critical. And, and many times this gets overlooked or missed. Um, on the second point, I think the answer in theory is very simple. How do you solve it? Where do you solve it? Of course, you solve it at the source, right? If you can. And that's that's tougher, uh, you know, more, more harder to do than to say it. Uh, we all try it. We, we try sometimes to have the wrong solution, maybe because we didn't diagnose it properly. But if, if it is clear that this is the source and it is wrong at the source, then the answer is pretty simple. We have to find a way of solving it at source, nowhere else. Thank you. Um, I'd like to, to um, put another audience question to you as well, actually. Um, and uh, again, this, this might be one for Neil, but are there parts of back office modernization we could outsource? <laughs> well, as a vendor and with, with some degree of expertise, <laughs> we're, we're, we're bound to say yes. I, 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 interestingly, I think when, you, when people say that, they well, think about outsourcing that, they think that they won't have the expertise, they won't have the knowledge. What I would su suggest is that, in fact, many organisations have lost their own expertise. And one of the problems in, in many of these projects is that um, nobody knows what's really happening. There's, a, there's so many, there are so many black holes in that spider's web diagram that where people have lost the understanding. So I think your risk of outsourcing is actually relatively low. Uh, I, I might want to just talk a, bit, a little bit about how, you, how we deal with that better. Mm -hmm. And, and I, think, I think actually in terms of processes that we employ around these modernization pro projects, being agile and fix after fail, a fix after fail approach may be the best way to do things rather than, you know, I, I said before, to do analysis, you absolutely should do a degree of analysis. But there is, a, there is a, some point at which you just should just transform and, and where that transformation causes a problem because you haven't factored in this, this particular thing that you, the organization had long since forgotten about, that you were able to respond very quickly. So I think, I think you can outsource. I think the risk of outsourcing, in, in fact, is lower than you might believe, but you've got to outsource to an organization that can be agile so that when things go wrong, they can respond very, very quickly and yeah. work with you as a partner, not as a vendor. Great, thank you. Um, we'll have one more uh, audience uh, question before we go back to our uh, um, the questions that we have pre-prepared. Um, so uh, this is an interesting one. We have a real cultural problem here. How does the panel suggest we bring together the front office and back office people to make this work well? Uh, Omar. I, I think one of the things that I've done with other organizations is something called service blueprinting. So 
essentially it's taking the full journey of a transaction and it's kind of like taking the disney effect where add emotions to your transactions or your trades and then really take them down that cycle understand what sort of uh, paths and, and blockers they go through and even if you need to draw smiley faces or sad faces just to kind of exhibit that and add a bit of aesthetics to it it takes you down that whole or, or that um, that path of understanding where are the biggest pain points across the front office and back office is the transition between front and back truly where this main character who's, who's our transaction is exhibiting the worst part of its journey and if so how do we ensure that we close that trade so if we can use those service blueprinting and, and design thinking Um, techniques to kind of map out the entire journey, there's always ways to map out in front of everyone or all of the stakeholders what those biggest pain points are and how to collectively solve for them. Roche, anything you'd you'd like to add to that? Yeah, no, that was, I think, very good. I think we, um, it's it's not easy, right? Culturally, when we talk about uh, the differences and and we have two sets of people with a focus on revenue and a different focus on on back office, right? So try and get them together. I think one of the ways, in addition to what uh, Omar suggested, would be to try and look at the value from each way, right? So what's the value that back office brings to front office in addition to just taking care of the things after the trade has been done, right? So how can they leverage that knowledge, that, that vision or that visibility of what the back office does for their own good? So I think if they can be sold on the value, that definitely brings people together. Mm-hmm. Thank you. So, um, Neil, coming back to kind of technologies uh, and so on, I mean, what, what, what do you see as being some of the most useful technologies um, to, to enable this, this, this kind of digital transformation? And, and also, what, what kind of skills uh, are needed? We talked earlier a little bit about skills, but maybe we can drill down on that a bit more. Yeah, and I think we covered a lot of this, but um, to agree with Rishi, you know, we. There is an integration problem. We, we saw that on the poll. We all understand there's an integration problem. Mo- modern integration capabilities are, are going to be essential. You're going to be, you're going to be moving data around between, between organizations more as more as we you know, we're already talk, talked about outsourcing. So you need the connectivity that can take stuff out of your firewall and bring stuff back in from, from your outsource provider. You need to be in control. So you need technologies that are going to tell you in simple ways, that simple dashboarding that Omar talked about across the whole landscape of the systems that you own, the systems that you've outsourced. You need a, you need a dashboarding to give you to give you both the illusion and the reality of control. You need to be able to drill through from that high level dashboard to the problems. You need to be able to get those problems back into the flow as quickly as possible. We've talked a lot about data, uh, but you know data is going to be at the heart of this. And you need you need you need to make sure that your your your, your data is right. And yeah, we, we know it's difficult. We know there are problems. We know that, that we haven't got the full as an, as as a domain. We haven't got all of the solutions here yet. But you, you do need to be worrying about that data, and you need capabilities for managing your data from from inception to 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 its final usage. Mm-hmm. You're tracking that data and you're measuring and monitoring that data. Yeah, yeah. So that's the technology side of it. I mean. Rashir, what about skill sets? What, what, what are some of the key skill sets that uh, are needed here? I, I talked about them a bit before, right? It's more about the, the number of different skills coming together. I think technology-wise, if I can, um, I can maybe add to that, in, in addition to enterprise, I think with, um, with automation or RPAs, if you like, there's been a lot of... Um, lot of uh, a lot of force behind it in the last three, four or five years, right? RPAs and trying to uh, build things together. Uh, our experience is, yes, that's good in certain cases. Be very wary of uh, implementing those kind of patchworks at scale everywhere, right? Has to follow a certain decision criteria for, for you to say, okay, this is where it actually makes sense. This, it doesn't make sense. It might be an answer to keep things manual, uh, and hence having that skills and expertise in hand rather than building a patchwork in some cases, right? So from a skill point of view, yes, technological skills, but I would say process skills are still key and the context, right? So when you are in a, in a financial institution environment, we really need to understand your data. You really need to know what that field 
what that attribute of that field actually means and how that can actually change the end result if you use X instead of Y in certain reporting or in data processes. Mm -hmm. Omar, anything, uh, anything you'd like to add on that? Yeah, I think I, I completely agree with everything that was said. What I would say is in addition to those new skills that um, organizations should bring in, it's also important that internally we hone our, some of our existing skills because what happens usually is we ask our technology teams to be more business savvy or be more finance savvy, whereas it's also important to help our front office staff and back office staff be more or gain more digital fluency. Because mm -hmm. if they have a better understanding of uh, the technology and how it works, they're the process experts. And then they can leverage both of those skills to come up with new use cases where we can leverage technology and they can help shape the what of what we're trying to achieve as a vision. Whereas the technology teams can then solve for the how much easier. Excellent, thank you. So staying with you, Omar, um, if we look at increasing efficiency, cutting costs in, you know, in the, the back office and operations, um, how, are there any particular quick wins or sweet spots that automation and digitization can help with, you think? Yeah, and it might not sound as sexy, but digitizing our systems and paper-based processes, it's essential to any data strategy or data management strategy, especially you know what Rashir was mentioning before. Um, so subsequently, it also opens the doors for any predictive and prescriptive algorithms that we can then develop within or internally. Um, essentially, organizations can lose clients and hordes with a non-digitized and frustrating experience. Um, in terms of automation, I'd say the automation of tedious and repetitive processes through RPA and other means, it can add huge efficiency gains, it can significantly reduce risk, and it can be instrumental to increasing the capacity needed for business growth. From an employee engagement perspective, I mean, your employee's brain power is incredibly valuable. So why waste it on mundane tasks like copying data from Excel to your CRM? Sounds, uh, so, so, sounds like the, uh, the, the right approach. What about um, uh, Rashir, any, any thoughts from you on that? Oh, I think we have, we have said enough on this topic, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Automation okay. technologies are key, so yes. Let's yeah, it's, that. that's probably a good, uh, um, a good prompt for the next poll then, actually, if we bring that up. Um, so this final poll of the webinar is, um, what operational and business benefits does or would your organization expect to gain from modernizing the back office. And again, this is a multiple answer poll. Um, so significant operational benefits, some operational benefits, significant business benefits, some business benefits or no benefits. So again, while the, uh, the audience is, is responding to that poll, um, Neil, I'd like to ask you maybe if you can give us a bit of a kind of practical guide on how to get started on back office modernization and manage project risks and uh, accelerate that delivery of value. Yeah, uh, and I think it's it's really important, isn't it, to, to to show some quick wins because I think there is a degree of skepticism around any of these large scale projects. So I, I'd be a strong advocate of deliver frequently and often. Is that so? Frequently and something. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> just deliver. Um, you know, show success early, Re get buy-in. And in terms of that question earlier around the cultural differences, I think, and, and to the poll that's in play at the moment, that success that, that has got to be around a business, a business success. I don't, think, I don't think it can be operational. I think you need to show that you delivered something that's given an uptick for the business. And mm -hmm. I think you then start to break down some of those cultural problems. So be agile in your approach, deliver frequently, deliver against business needs, not operational needs. And I think that's a great way to get started. Now, uh, in terms of where I think that, what, that, what I think that might mean is actually what I said earlier, which is look at the things that you no longer need to do. Look at the things that are, that are, are commoditized, the things that you used to differentiate you but no longer do. Move, uh, move, move, stop doing them, actually. And that can be a quick win and hopefully give you a business uptick. 
Okay, thank you. And uh, I think we've got some poll results in now. So um, interestingly, we're kind of tied between some, oh, actually, no, it's just still still moving. So some operational benefits is the, uh, the highest ranking one at the moment, uh, followed by some business benefits and then significant operational benefits and significant business benefits. So any surprises there for any of you? Not on yeah, this so one. Shaking heads here. Sure <laughs> yeah. So, but I, I think this comes back to what you were just saying, um, um, there, Neil, about that it needs to be, you know, all of this kind of needs to focus on business benefits. And obviously, you know, it can deliver operational benefits, but uh, I guess the focus really needs to be on the business. Yeah, um, like I, I, I'm sorry to jump in here, but I, I'm actually curious uh, around why there isn't a lot of significant, whether it's operational or business benefits. And I'm just wondering if modernization programs almost bring the back office to a stage where this is where we should be. And it's not necessarily, it's not innovative to take us away from faxes and paper-based forms. And mm -hmm. that's why it might not necessarily be perceived as significant, but uh, still it's really interesting. And I'm, I'm actually quite pleased with, with the responses of these polls. I think we have a very pragmatic audience. Yeah, no, and it's interesting what you say there actually, because, you know, is, is there a danger of, of um, people kind of maybe not aiming far enough uh, and not looking for significant business or operational benefits and just kind of seeing that, yeah, this can improve some things, but it's not really going to move us forward, is it? Is, is that a, um, something that you see maybe? Yeah, it's, it's also about expectation management. Sorry, Omar, go on. No, no, no go on, go on, Richard. I was just saying, this is also about expectation management, right? So it depends on the culture of the organization. Do you overpromise under deliver or you under promise and over deliver right that's that's very different way and uh, what neil said was about showing quick results and frequent results i think those are confidence builder in the end of the day right so your benefits might end up being significant but you may not perceive it at the beginning of the program either intentionally or unintentionally Thank yeah you. what yeah go on what, what i would what i would add to that is um and, and similar to what Neil was mentioning around delivering frequently, and I think quickly was the other word, but mm -hmm. um, rapid experimentation uh, of new technologies, new vendors, new processes um, and methodologies is critical to delivering quick wins or quick losses too. Um, and that really sets up a foundation for a nice iterative development of strategic platforms. And worst case, if we need to nimble, if the technology has advanced, we're not spending a ton of time with analysis paralysis before actually delivering something that adds value to an organization. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. I'd like to, to um, bring up one other uh, audience question if possible. And, and that's, um, my organization would like to modernize the back office, but limited budget is available. Where should we invest this and what benefits can we gain? So uh, presumably this is something that you, you come across kind of limited budgets for these kind of things. So what would be your advice here? Um, Rishi? Yeah, I mean, it's always limited budget, right? I haven't heard anyone say they have unlimited budget for these kind of things, so <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Um, I, I would go back to um, pilots, right? So agile, quick benefits, because if you use that money to show real tangible business benefit, you're bound to get the next round of funding for the next uh, bigger experimentation or uh, industrialization and so on, right? So that could be one of the good ideas to use that money on something focused, something that can serve as, well, if we do this and we get this benefit, it can be scaled 10 times to give you X times benefit, right? If you can prove that with that proof of concept, then that's a very good use of that limited budget. And so really having demonstrable results just yeah, yeah, and uh, I mean, can I, can I just respond yeah, to something yeah, there? Because, uh, yeah. um, and I was talking to um, an all world thing on Gresham yesterday. I was talking a little bit about how um, we perceive business as as a, as a as a bit of a game. You know, it's a game of football. We pl we play it over ninety minutes, and at the end of the ninety minutes, there's a winner and there's a loser, and 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 it's and it's it's job done that's that's the way kind of people talk about it. You, you beat the competition 
but that's that's not the way it works is it because you know in in business 90 minutes comes the final whistle blows but actually the competition don't notice that the final whistle has gone and they carry on competing and actually it's not just that they 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 carry on competing but the game you're playing may change the market requirements may change and when we think about organizations with small budgets i think what you what you've got to think about here is what game are you playing? Are, are, have, have, have things moved along? Because almost certainly they will have done. You're, you, you, you've, got to, you've got to continually be responding to that competition because the competition won't hear the final whistle. And the market requirements will, will, will forever be changing. And there will always be an opportunity, no matter how small your budget, there will always be an opportunity to respond to the to your better competitors, your the, the changing competitors to, to change to those changing market needs. You know, I I I I, re- I was telling people to be pessimistic a, a while ago. <laughs> now I'd encourage you to be optimistic and, and look at look at how look at how you can beat the competition, look at how you can respond to those new market requirements. There's always going to be an opportunity. Figure out how to exploit that opportunity. Mm-hmm. Omar, anything to add there? I completely agree with continuing to adapt to, to what the competition is doing, but there's also been a rise of co-opetition. There's, there's network platforms now that help um, competitors work on the same platform so that they achieve those economies of scale um, and they're able to kind of leverage a lot of the added value that those platforms add. Um, what I would say as well is, <laughs> and that question really hit hard because not only is it a limited budget, but sometimes it keeps shrinking for whatever reason. Um, I think if you want to find creative ways of adding value while that budget is shrinking or, or being more limited, it's not about technology. It's not about finding the cheapest technology and throwing it at the solution. It, it I think it's actually non-tech focused where you need to find creative ways of mapping out your processes and capabilities. There needs to be better ways of um, managing the overall intake of new ideas uh, of how to solve for some of those inefficiencies. Because if you're just relying on a handful of people within your organization to tell you um, what problems need to be solved, or one, you're getting a, a pretty biased view, and two, you're not exactly fostering a culture of innovation that way. Um, And so people will feel that their ideas aren't being as valued. The last thing I would say, and it's, it's, it's something I'd recommend anyone to do is work with your local universities, your local incubators, find the ways of um, utilizing some of that, what will be expensive talent, uh, but try to find ways of, of leveraging them to solve for part of your problem or part of your solution without spending a ton of money. So those are, you know, my pieces of advice. Thanks. And it's uh, interesting because we're, we're coming towards the end of the webinar uh, now. And uh, the, the final question is, you know, what three pieces of advice would you give to data practitioners uh, working to modernize the back office to meet the needs of the front office? Um, so uh, I'll come back to you, Omar, to see if you've got any more advice, but maybe go to, uh, to Neil first. What are your three pieces of advice? I, I, I think we've largely covered them but I, but I may in a um, nutshell in a nutshell in, in, well in a nutshell and, and looking at looking at the what is it the five of us I can't count the five of us and, and I like to put this plug in but I think it's really really important is just one piece of advice let's have more diversity let's let's let, let's let's bring in challenging thinking and why isn't there a woman on this panel good question you know, let there was going to be, but she she was she was going to be the moderator, uh, but she's on holiday, which is why you've got me. Sorry. <laughs> so that would be my, my my final closing advice. Bring let's 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 have more diverse thinking. Let's challenge our thinking. Let's be pessimistic and optimistic at the same time. Thank you, and Rashia. Yep, I, I try to be pessimistic then. <laughs> uh, uh, I think we talked about skills and I think diversity goes in that direction, right? So you need 
different skills and you need diversity for that because you need different ideas right you need different way of thinking not just technical skills so skill would be my my advice as well but combined with diversity so you need things that are being done differently or how would you do things differently and for that you need ideas so how do you foster new ideas bring in diversity that gives you good ideas right uh, if I had to add a couple of more, I, I would definitely go a bit towards data strategy. So taking stock of what you have, make sure you understand what you need, what you don't need. Uh, that was Neil's point. I have a very good anecdote in there where uh, many years ago, I was working for a very large data intensive company and there was so much spaghetti of, of data and pipelines and products. No one knew where that data was being used. And to find out whether they are using something or not, we decided to stop one feed. Said, okay, let's stop it and see if someone complains. One week passed, two weeks passed, no one complained. We thought, okay, maybe we can shut this down, right? So having that different way of thinking, experimentation uh, to, to be more creative in what you can stop and be more efficient, that'd be good. Great, thanks. Um, Omar, is there anything you'd like to add to your earlier um, advice that you gave or? Uh... Um, yeah, I mean, I would, I would like I said, I would suggest not putting too much emphasis on the digital component of uh, digital transformation. So modernizing the back office that essentially needs a holistic cultural change at times where the back office lands with the front office to, to tackle some of the disruptive threats out there. Um, it's also needed to expand just overall value proposition to give clients low touch or even a no touch experience um, and to find cost efficiencies across the functions. It's like I said, it's not just about piling through the list of tools you have and forcing it in to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's also important to understand some of the trends uh, shaping the markets, major initiatives such as CSDR, a move to a T plus one settlement model in the near future. They're critical, but not isolated reasons for organizations to modernize their back office. And, and depending on where you are in the globe, there's now more scrutiny around the ethical use of customer and employee data that we all need to keep in mind when working with data in general. And then finally, I guess what I would say is, finding that balance between accelerating value delivery and managing risk is crucial. So, and, and I'm not great with analogies, but the metaphor I'll use is when it's done right, a digital transformation program or a modernization program is like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. But if you don't stick to the strategy, if you don't pick the right tools, if you don't hire and promote the right leaders, it could turn your program into just a faster caterpillar. So mm -hmm. selecting the right digital infrastructure, um, but not investing in the people and processes means you haven't built a transformation. You've just built a more expensive facade. Great. Well, thank you, uh, all of you. for That's been a really, really interesting discussion. So thank you, Omar, Rashir, um, and Neil for, uh, for your insights today. Um, and thank you to, uh, to Gresham for sponsoring today's webinar. Um, before we close, uh, just a few 18 group uh, items that may be of interest to you. Um, if you scroll down the screen to additional options, you can find out about 18 Connect, our professional platform that you can use to deliver highly effective and interactive events and webinars. Uh, you can also download the latest version of our regulatory data handbook, and you can sign up for our data management uh, summit, which is on May the 11th. Um, so that's it for today. So thank you again to a great group of speakers, really good uh, panel discussions. Thanks for that. And thank you to everybody who, uh, who have taken part today. And uh, thanks to the audience for participating in the polls and uh, submitting some uh, interesting questions. And uh, please don't forget to complete our feedback form because we're always keen to hear people's views and improve our products. So that's it for today. Thanks again and goodbye. <laughs>